Welcome, sir. Thank you, Bishop. Praise the Lord. What a joy to be in Edo State and to be with the church in Edo State and to strengthen the church, lift up the church, place the church and the ministers of the church where Christ has placed us. And I pray that these sessions together will open our eyes to know and to see and then empower to go and do what Christ has done and what he has now put us as his representatives to do. Christ never gets involved with anything except the excellent ministry. And that's what he calls us to. And I pray that the Lord will empower, will anoint, and will energize every one of us that that excellence ministry we will discover, we will discern, and then we will do in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we're here for you. Son, we're here for you. Holy Ghost, we're here for you. Search us, lead us, empower us so that we will effectively handle everything you've given us to do. We pray that the excellent ministry will be established in the church, in this state, in this nation, and then in the nations of the world in Jesus' name. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name, we pray. And everybody shout, Amen. Amen. We're looking at Hebrews. Thank you. Consider we're looking at Hebrews chapter 8. And I'm reading from verse 6. Hebrews chapter 8. We're looking at verse 6. It says, But now he has obtained a more excellent ministry by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant which was established upon better promises you'll see there is talking about christ our savior our lord not only our savior and lord our forerunner our example and our model it says he has obtained if we're going to be in the excellent ministry we have to obtain you cannot attain it by your own power by your own strength and by your own ingenuity we obtain a more excellent ministry you never obtain anything except you desire you never obtain anything except you are willing to abandon the things that are not excellent we have to leave the bad for the good we have to leave even the good for the better we have to leave the past for the present and that is how we obtain that more excellent ministry if you are satisfied with what you have if you're satisfied with everything you've done, you'll not even have the eagerness, you'll not have the desire, you'll not have the passion, you'll not have the drive, you'll not want to pay the price to obtain what is higher, what is greater, the more excellent missing. Now says by how much he also is the mediator of a better covenant wants to stay with the old covenant the abolished covenant the old testament covenant wants to stay with that and you are before calvary and you are before even the open the first page of matthew you're still there in the old you're still there dwelling in malachi you're still there dwelling in exodus and leviticus and you have not crossed over to that covenant which is new you'll be there but you'll not be following after christ you're doing everything that came before the cross and before calvary but it says now he is the mediator is no more aaron and is no more the sons of aaron and is no more the old testament old covenant theology it is the better covenant the new covenant 
and he's the mediator and he's sending us forth as ambassadors of that mediation of the mediator and then we we'll preach that better covenant he says which was established upon better promises have you seen that word better there a more excellent ministry better and it is a better covenant and it is the promise of God that he gave at Calvary and he finished it and finalized it and gave that to us now and we are now called as sons of God, daughters of God, ministers of God, servants of God, ambassadors in Christ that we will go to proclaim what Christ will be proclaiming today if he were in the world in the physical. In fact, he tells us in First Peter chapter 2 and it says in verse 21, for even here unto were ye called, he called us to salvation, he called us to service and he says here is where we are called to for because Christ also suffered for us leaving us an example, leaving us a model that ye should follow his steps, that now in life we follow his steps, in ministry we follow his steps, and in the preaching of the gospel we follow his steps, in the content of the gospel that we preach we follow his steps, if we are following any other personality, even in the Bible, if we're following Moses and if we're following the Levitical law, if we're following those old covenant people, we're not following Christ because he came to establish, he came to give us the better covenant established upon better promises. And he says, this is what to do and this is what to follow i pray the lord will so touch our hearts he'll so turn our hearts he'll so transform our hearts that we will follow without an ear's breath and without going this way or that way i will follow christ all the way through in this ministry, the excellent ministry in Jesus' name. And we're coming to uh, the first message today, and it is the compulsory spiritual experiences of an excellent minister. The compulsory spiritual experiences of an excellent ministry. Three things we're looking at. We're looking at number one, the supremacy and the of God's only begotten son. God's only begotten son, supreme, higher than all, higher than Moses, higher than Aaron, higher than Joshua, higher than the angels, higher than anyone that had ever lived on the face of the earth higher than Adam and Eve is supreme. God has given him that supremacy. Number two is the salvation by grace for obedient believing sons. Salvation. Salvation is for all. Why has not everyone gotten that salvation? Because there is a word from him. And that word, the word of grace, he gives us, he calls us, he says, repent ye and believe the gospel. And as we come to him in obedience to his call, in obedience to his word, in obedience to what he's telling us, and we believe on him, we become obedient believing sons. Number three is the sanctification for graciously open blood bought servants. As servants of God, we come to Him and we are open. We're open to Him at the point of salvation. We open our hearts, we tell Him where we have been, what we have done. We hide nothing nothing and then he calls us for service but he wants to know where are you 
What are you doing now? What's your intention? What's your passion? What's your consecration? What's your commitment? We open up to him and we reserve nothing. He calls us on the field and while we're there on the field, he says, I want to walk with you, but I don't walk with the people that are not sincere. Tell me what's in your heart and we're open to him. In the open blood bought servants of God that are sanctified and they do only what Christ will do. They think only what Christ will think and they go they go for only what Christ will go for those sanctified gracious open blood bought and blood washed and blood cleansed servants of God are the people he places in position he says good deal what I have been doing then he makes us ambassadors of him and representatives of himself. We're looking at number one here. Number one is the supremacy of God's only begotten son. We're looking at Hebrews chapter one and we're looking at verse one. It says God who at sundry times and in diverse manners speak in time past unto, unto the uh, fathers by the prophets. You know what he's saying? He said in time past he spoke by the prophets. Look at verse two. It says as in these last days spoken unto us by his son. It says it's gone higher. It's revealing the kind of salvation that the prophets were examining and searching whether it was for them or not. It says he spoke to the fathers by those prophets, but now in these last days, he has spoken unto us. He's speaking unto us by his son, whom he has appointed, whom he has appointed, whom he has appointed, no man appointed him. And no nation appointed him. Israel did not appoint him. They crucified him. Israel did not exalt him. They slew him. Israel did not anoint, appoint, and engage the Lord Jesus Christ. The appointment of the Lord. The appointment of the Savior. It was not by voting. Even voting by angels or voting by men. It was the appointment of God. That it says whom he has appointed. Heir of all things. Possessor of all things. By whom also he made the worlds. Look at verse 13. In verse 3 it says, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, that he is Christ, the Son, the Savior, our Lord, is the express image of God's person. Everything the Father wanted done, he did. If you're thinking of the will of God, Jesus is the expression of the will of God. Is salvation will of God? Yes, because Jesus is the expression of the will of God. Is healing the will of God? Yes, because he did that. And Jesus is the expression of the will of God. Is holiness the will of God in every generation for everyone? Yes, because Jesus is the expression of the will of God. And he's upholding all things by the word of his power. When he had by himself purged our sins, not Christ, an angel, whatever the name of the angel, he by himself alone purged our sins. Not, um, not Jesus and the founder of a denomination, the founder of a religion, but Jesus by himself. If you are praying for salvation, you pray only in the name of Jesus. There is no other name given among men whereby we must be saved except the name of Jesus. If you are praying for any blessing from the Father, any blessing from heaven, you pray in the name of Jesus and Jesus. Jesus only because he by himself, himself alone, he purged our sins and now he sat down on the right hand of majesty 
on high. We're talking about Christ and we're talking about his supremacy, the supremacy of God's only begotten son. Look at three things here. Number one, we're looking at uh, the exalted position of the anointed son. Exalted, exalted position of the anointed son. Number two, is the experienced purging by his acceptable sacrifice. Number three, is the extraordinary power of the almighty sustainer. Look at number one there. Number one is the exalted position of the anointed son. It tells us in Philippians chapter 2, reading there from verse 9, wherefore God also has highly exalted him. God also. God, if you believe in God as the creator, if you believe in God as the disposer of all things, if you believe in God as the possessor of the whole earth, because he made the walls and the fullness thereof, if you say you believe in God, here's what God has done. If you put down who God has exalted, you are not worth God. If you shatter what God is putting together, you are not of God. It says, wherefore, God has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. He has given Christ, his only begotten son, a name above every name. In verse 10, it says that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. Give me a good amen. amen. And your knee is who to, is to bow first. You know, there are people, they want that enemy to bow, and they are not bowing to the name of Jesus. They are not surrendered. All to Jesus I surrender. All to him I freely give. They do not bow the knee. They do not subject themselves to Christ as Savior. Christ as Lord. And Christ as Commander. And while they are standing firm, adamant in their own mind. Adamant and they stand like that. And they will not bow. Bend for Christ. They want the name of Jesus to work for them and everything to bend before them. It doesn't happen that way. You are the one to bow first. All your desires, all your aspiration, everything, all your ambition, everything, your thoughts, I want to be, I want to do, I want to go, I want to let that one bow. Put everything beneath the feet of Christ and say, Lord, not my will, but as thou wilt. And it is when you have your mind, your heart, your life, your ambition, your personality bowing unto the Lord, then you can come in the place of authority and everything you say shall bow will bow in Jesus' name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. And then in verse 11, it says, and that every tongue should confess. Before you tell other people to confess Christ, your own tongue too, should confess him and confess him as the one that can forgive and confess him as the one that can cleanse. If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins. He doesn't stop there and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And when that has taken place, now we come to other people and we tell them, you know what the Bible says? That you confess, every tongue shall confess that Jesus is Lord. And you cannot say that if Jesus is not your Lord, if he's not the Lord of your plan. If you say, like Pilate, what I've written, I've written. What I've planned, I've planned. And my mind is set. Not even a verse of scripture can change. I, what I want to do, what I plan is what I plan. If you are like that, you're not making him your Lord. But when you come and you say, Lord, 
I, I, I thought this is what I will do. I thought this is where I will go. I thought this is what I will plan. But now you are Lord, the captain of my salvation. It says to the glory of God the Father, the exalted position of the anointed son. Look at number two here. Number two, it says, the experience purging by his acceptable sacrifice. By his acceptable sacrifice. I'm sure you know that since he had done the sacrifice, acceptable, he has given the sacrifice. He said, it is finished. If you, by any means, in what, whatever way, you go to bring another sacrifice, it will be like the sacrifice of Cain. It will not be accepted. That's why hearts are not changed. That's why hearts are not transformed. They want, they're not satisfied with the final acceptable sacrifice of Christ. They must bring their own sacrifice. Yes, I see Abel brought the acceptable sacrifice and looking forward to the lamb that is slain for the sins of the world. But Cain said, not me, the works of my hand, it amounts to nothing. In fact, it's less than nothing. It's negative. It's rejected by the Lord. When you, we have the final sacrifice of Christ, it is finished and it is free and it is full. Everything we need from heaven, we get through Christ because the purging comes and the forgiveness comes and the purification comes and the possession of the blessing of God. Everything comes by the acceptable sacrifice of Christ. Any other sacrifice knocks you off kicks you off. Any other sacrifice makes the father to turn away from you. Who is this man that is still bringing a fowl, still bringing a goat, and still bringing a, you know, tortoise or whatever and he thinks he's going to please me. He wants to replace the sacrifice of my only begotten son with whatever sacrifice it makes God to turn away Way from such a person. He tells us in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, who being the express, the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself. If you're going to be free from sin consciousness, if you're going to be free from the overpowering influence of sin in your past life, if you're going to be free from any remembrance of your past life by himself, Christ, Christ only, he purged our sins. Uh, there are times when you know people think they have washed clothes. It's not clean enough. The wash plates is not clean enough. And no man can purge and cleanse and forgive. And no man can purify like Christ. In fact, the only washing, the only cleansing, the only purification acceptable in heaven is the one Christ has done when he had by himself purged our sins and now he sat down why did he sit down he sat down because everything has been done it's finished the work it's accomplished the work and the father has given attestation to that that i accept that you don't have to do anything anymore christ doesn't have to pay another price, do another sacrifice because before we can be pardoned, before we can be saved, before we can be purged, before we can be sanctified, the blood has been shed. Now he sat on the right hand 
of majesty on high. Look at First Corinthians chapter 5. I'm reading from verse 7. In First Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, Purge out therefore the old leaven, that she may be a new lamb, as ye are and as ye are unleavened, for even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. You have to believe that. You have to accept that. You have to claim that and cling to that, that when I see his blood, it's no more the, the animal sacrifice in the Old Testament, but Christ who died and Christ who rose again and Christ who has the power, the power to forgive, the power to cleanse, the power to renew, and the power to bruise the enemy, the devil, and the power to even raise the dead. He has the power, all power in heaven on earth is given unto him. He says now because he sacrificed for us, come place your confidence in that. Look at verse 8. In verse 8, therefore, let us keep the feast not with the old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness. Now, Christ has forgiven you if you are born again and now you cannot hold malice again and you cannot say I'm going to revenge that other church that other believer has done something I don't appreciate it says are you purged are you cleansed then he cleanses you from the hatred of the old life and he says all malice all wickedness were abandoned but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Insincerity is gone. Hypocrisy is gone. Pretense is gone because we're purged by the blood of the Lamb. Look at number three here. Number three, we're looking at the extraordinary power of the almighty sustainer. The extraordinary power of the almighty sustainer. When you came at Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3, it says, who being the uh, brightness of his glory, he has, uh, and the express image of his person, upholding all things, upholding all people, upholding all believers, upholding all his promises, upholding everything that heaven has made available for us. Christ is the one that upholds all things by the word of his power. When he had by himself purged our sins and sat down on the right hand of majesty. And I look at verse 4. In verse 4 it says, being made so much better so much greater, so much higher than the angels, he as he as by inheritance obtained, obtained, obtained a more excellent name than they. Look at Christ. Christ is the almighty sustainer. We're looking at Isaiah chapter 9 and we're looking at verse 6. Isaiah chapter 9 we're looking at Verse 6, it tells us in verse 6, For unto us a child is born. Why was Christ born for us? So he can save us and heal us and deliver us. And so that he can take us from the valley of despondency and take us to the mountain top of excitement and joy in the Lord. He says, unto us. A child is born. And then it says, Unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. First of all, when you know that Christ was born because of you. Given by the Father on the cross because of you. The whole government of your life. You put on a shoulder. The administration of your life, you put on a shoulder. And the goings in and the goings out of your life, 
you put upon his shoulder the decisions and desires of your life you put upon his shoulder i don't understand the people that say christ was born for them and Christ was given for them. And Christ has forgiven them. And Christ has turned their lives around for the better. And they hold on to the government of their lives. And they hold on to the administration of their lives. And they hold on to the leadership of their lives. When you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord, He was born because of you. He gave Himself because of you. The government of your life comes upon his shoulder. The church, the church, every church that is named, that names the name of Christ will put the administration of the church, the government of the church, the leadership of the church, everything the church will put upon his shoulder. And when this world at the second coming of Christ, when they will receive him at the coming Lord, and they receive him, he is now king of kings and lord of lords. You know what will happen? All the governments of the world will be upon his shoulder. Anyone, anywhere, any group of people, any nation, at whatever dispensation, when we accept him and receive him, and we know that is the Son of God, and the whole world accepts him at that time, and the kingdoms of the world shall be the kingdom of our Lord and of our Lord Jesus Christ. And he says, The government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful. Tell me, Wonderful. Our lives will not be wonderful until we place everything, our mind, our life, our decisions, our behavior, our character, our body, everything will place squarely upon his shoulder. And we say, lead on because I accept you. I receive you in a practical way. You are my Lord and sell your life or turn around. Every word you say, every decision you make, every act you have, everything you do, when everything is put upon his shoulder, now will your life be wonderful. He will become the counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Father of eternity, and the Prince of Peace. Look at verse 7. In verse 7 of the increase of his kingdom and peace, there shall be no end upon the throne of David, upon the kingdom to order it. To order it. Christ is the one that brings orderliness to our lives, you know, when you are confused, you cannot be orderly. And when you are traumatized, you cannot be orderly. When you are thinking of this and thinking of that, and the ideas of the world, they are pulling you here and there in different directions, you cannot be orderly. Your speech will not be orderly. You will forget yourself. Your actions will not be orderly in the, in the sight of God. But when you place everything on him and you have no care in this world and you cast all your cares on him because he careth for you, then your life will be orderly. Your family will be orderly. Your business will be orderly. Your aspiration, ambition, and everything you go after will just go in line one after the other in Jesus' name. And to establish it with justice, judgment, and with justice from henceforth, even forever. The seal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Can you put all your plans in the hands of God and allow the zeal of the Lord of hosts to perform it? Can you put all your project and everything, everything you feel you want to do, put everything in the hands of him who has saved you? And then the zeal of the Lord will perform it in Jesus' name. Amen. We're looking at Matthew chapter 28, verse 18. Here is what Jesus declared. Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, 
all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. No angel can say that. How will you then stay on the side of angels and abandon Christ? And Moses could not say that. How will you go back to Moses and abandon Christ here? Yeah, only Christ. Because of who he is. And because of his exalted personality and position. He is the only one that said, that says, that can say anytime, every time, to any person, to every person. Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, all power power to save all power power to heal all power power to deliver all power power to sanctify all power power to baptize in the holy ghost all power power to subdue every negative thing every negative personality all power power to carry you through here on earth till you get to heaven all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth we're coming to point number two here point number two we're looking at the salvation by grace for obedient believing sons and there are three things we're looking at number one we're looking at so great salvation and escape from eternal suffering number two we're looking at such a great savior and emancipator of endangered sinners number three the gloomy situation and exhortation against empty service look at number one number one is the great salvation and escape from eternal suffering we're looking at hebrews chapter 2 verse 1 therefore we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard we need to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard. When somebody goes to the doctor, he gives honest heed. He, he listens to every word because he wants healing. When anybody goes to the bank, he listens to every word and he gives the honest heed to what the bank manager is saying on your interest going up or you may be you are going in the red and everything is going to be suspended except you do this when anybody goes to an engineer he wants to build a house on solid ground he listens to every word with earnest heed but human beings is only human beings that come to the savior who can save them from sin and save them from suffering and save them from hell and save them from all evil here on earth and in eternity they don't pay the more earnest heat that's why sinners come to church five times ten times two hundred times they come to church for years and they're not born again and they're not saved. why because they do not give the more earnest heed to the things they hear that's why many people can come to the church and they say i'm saved i'm saved but their inner life has not been cleansed there's no sanctification there's no holiness without which no man shall save the lord you know why they do not give the more honest heed to the things they have heard that's why many people come to conferences the conferences that will lift them up and lift them higher empower them and lift them and give them and make them a different minister and make them somebody that you know will go higher than anybody ever dreamed but it doesn't happen why they do not give the more honesty therefore we ought we ought we have to give the more honest heed to the things which we have heard lest at any time we should let them sleep at the time 
of decision to decide for Christ. At that time, everything they have heard, they let that sleep. At the time of a sudden temptation, and everything they have heard that will give them the victory, they let that sleep. At the time of challenge, challenge from the world, how they ought to respond, how they ought to react, they let what they have heard, they let that sleep. And because of that, they do not have the victory they ought to have. Look at verse 2. It says in verse 2, For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received, it just recompense of reward. Look at verse 3. It says, How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation the people they don't reject it's not that they say no salvation is not real salvation does not come from christ they believe all that but they neglect there are things you may not reject outright you may not say no i can get saved by myself you say and you accept that jesus and jesus only can save Save from sin. And yet, you neglect the time to pray, the time to ask, the time to receive, and the time to have a transforming salvation. And the time to have a life-changing salvation. The time to have a salvation that will put your name in the book of life. You neglect. How do you neglect at the time of prayer? I need to visit the toilet now. Uh -huh. You're neglecting something. Before you come back, we we'll say in Jesus' name we'll pray. And then you just do this and say you got something, you got nothing. How do you neglect? You neglect by at the time of prayer, that's the time you are talking to this person and talking, I have not seen you for a long time. So you are there. What have you been? And we're all praying and they are discussing, carrying on there. You neglect your salvation, you neglect his power, you neglect what Christ would have done while you go aside and you are involved in other things and he says, how shall we escape damnation? How shall we escape condemnation? How shall we escape eternal suffering in hellfire if we neglect, whether we're Jews or Gentile, if we neglect, whether we're members or ministers of the church, if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him, salvation. We must not neglect because it's dangerous to neglect. That's why it says in Hebrews chapter 4, reading there from verse 1, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 1, let us therefore fear lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest. Any of you shall seem to come short of it. You know, after Christ has done everything, you know after you have heard about the way of salvation, about the way of grace, and the way of faith, after you have heard the possibility of being saved, saved now, and saved forever, after you have heard, there's still the danger of not Entering into his rest, not entering into his restoration, not entering into reconciliation with God, not entering into regeneration of your soul and the turning around. He said there's still the danger of the people who have heard not entering him. And it says in verse 2, it says in verse 2, for unto us what the gospel preached as well as unto them but the word preached did not profit them did not profit them unto salvation did not profit them unto sanctification and holiness the word preached did not profit them unto healing and deliverance the word preached did not profit them but the word preached the word declared 
the word emphasized, the word highlighted, did not profit them not being mixed with faith in them that had it. Look at verse 3. In verse 3 it says, For we which have believed do enter into rest, into reconciliation, into regeneration, into restoration, restoration of what Adam lost. And now we come because Christ has come to give us total, complete, and full restoration. We that have believed do enter into rest. As he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. It's when we give ourselves to what we're hearing. It's then the salvation, real salvation that comes with rest, that comes with reconciliation, that comes with righteousness will be ours. It will be yours in Jesus' name. Look at Hebrews chapter 5 verse 9. Hebrews chapter 5 we're looking at verse 9. It says in verse 9, And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. Unto all them that obey him. Those who disregard the Savior. No, they don't have eternal salvation. And those who shun and kick away the Savior, the word of the Savior, they don't have eternal salvation. Those who just go and they live what they want to live and they don't pay any attention to the words of Christ. They say, yes, I got him as my Savior, but after, after that, I go my own way. I live my own life and I take my life out of a sand, and I have my life to live like I want to live. They don't have eternal salvation. They drop by the way. He has become, he's made perfect, and he became the author of eternal salvation only unto those that will be him. Let's look at number two there. Number two here, we're looking at such a great savior and emancipator of endangered sinners. Sinners are endangered. In this life, sinners are endangered because Satan is going to and fro and up and down to see whom he will devour. And if there's a sinner there, a deliberate sinner, an habitual sinner, an adamant sinner, a careless sinner, as Satan goes up and down to and fro, is seeking whom he may devour. That's a candidate for being devout. Why? Because they don't keep close to the Savior. And they don't keep close to their salvation. But such a great Savior is the one that comes to em emancipate us from endangered situations. We're looking at Hebrews chapter 2 and we're reading from verse 14. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 14 for as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise to part of the same that through death, the death at Calvary, he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. When Christ died on the cross of Calvary, he destroyed the power of the devil over you. Yeah. But you have to come and say, other lords have been our lords. Other men, other ministers, other people, other founders have been our Lord, but now we yield ourselves to you as the only Lord. And when you do that, what he did at Calvary, that he nullified, he kicked off, he destroyed the power of him that had the power of death, the devil. That's when it avails for you. Look at verse 15, in verse 15, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject unto bondage. Because of fear, 
this may happen, that might happen. They come in bondage to herbalists. They come in bondage to traditionalists. They come in bondage to the bullies in their life. You know, any, if you want to, you know, surrender to bullies, they're all around. And they bully your life. And they say, don't stand. Don't sit. Don't go. Don't, back, uh, don't, don't get that way. And they bully and bully until they make you to turn your face from the Savior and turn unto them. It might be a man. It might be a woman. And they bully and bully you and shut you down until even though you claim to be saved, you fear them so much and you remain in bondage. All your bondage shattered in Jesus' name. When you go out and you understand Christ, the Son of God, paid all the price for me. Where is the bully? And where is the fearful, fearsome person? Whatever he has, whoever he is, you turn your eyes away from them. You can even turn your back on them because God is at your back there. And it's in your front. It's in your side. And underneath you are the everlasting arms. Because you are saved. So you are not subject unto them anymore. You are free in Jesus name. And in Colossians chapter 2. I'm reading there from verse 13. It says that you being dead in your sins. And the uncircumcision of your flesh. He has quickened together with him. He has quickened made a life to Together with him, having forgiven all your trespasses. Amen. Look at verse 14. In verse 14, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. Then in verse 15, it says, and having spoiled principalities and powers, all principalities and powers, wanting to wage secret war, open war, deadly war against your life. All those principalities and powers, he has made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in each in Jesus' name. Look at number three here. Number three, we're looking at the gloomy situation and exhortation again against empty service the gloomy situation the gloomy situation and then uh, we're talking about exhortation against empty service you remember the children of israel they came out of the land of egypt and they kept on walking now into the promised land but they had a gloomy situation their tongue was not aligned and tamed to the promises of God, to the power of God, to the provision of God. And every time they came across a little challenge, a minor situation, their tongues released from the lordship of the one who has saved them. They began talking and talking and talking and they drank water from the rock. It didn't change their tongue. And the edge manna from heaven, it didn't change their tongue. And they heard the Watch of God directly from the man who went to the top of the mountain and received the covenant to the commandment for them, all that did not change them. The gloomy situation. That's why we're being exhorted now against empty service. When you wanted to build the tabernacle, all the people surrendered the good skin and they surrendered the gold and the silver they had, but it was an empty service. Their tongue canceled the efficacy and effectiveness of their service. That's what the Lord is telling us as we're going on in this journey that leads to life everlasting. We don't get ourselves by our tongue, by our headiness, 
by our stubbornness and by our opposition against the way of the Lord, we do not get ourselves into gloomy situation and then just be offering empty service. Empty service that takes us nowhere. Empty service that doesn't bring salvation here nor in eternity. We're looking at Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 12. It says, take heed brethren. It's talking to brethren. Lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. They were with the living God when he came out of the land of Egypt. But they departed after they sang, after the opening, the dividing of the Red Sea from the even chapter 15 of Exodus and then chapter 16 and then you go on, they departed from the living God. Look at verse 13. In verse 13, but exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Sin does not only give us guilt and condemnation, it gives us hardness of heart, sin. It gives us a seared conscience, sin. It gives us hardness of heart, and then we can do everything we think with uh, uh, without impunity. That is, we don't fear, we, we don't even think of what God can do. God has come out of the equation of the life of the person that sins and sins and sins and he says that's me if you want to accept me accept me as i am i may but heaven will not accept you as a dirty sinner as a defiled sinner as a defiant sinner as an abandoned adamant sinner stubborn sinner Heaven will not accept you just as you are. It takes a change of heart, a change of life. It takes holiness before we can get to heaven. But exhort one another daily while it is called today. Lest any of you, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Look at verse 14. In verse 14, for we are made partakers of Christ. If a people think there's no condition, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian. I'm born again, I'm born again, I'm saved, I'm saved forever. We need to qualify that you are saved forever if you keep on obeying the Lord. You are saved forever and you are on your way to Canaan. If like Caleb and Joshua, you keep on moving without copying the people that are adamant in their sins. It says, for we are made partakers of Christ. If we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast, until the end. If we hold the beginning, the beginning of our conviction, the beginning of our confession, the beginning of our conversion, the beginning of our believing in the Lord, we hold that steadfast until the end. And there are things that will like to you know, make you not hold the beginning of conviction, the beginning of conversion, and the beginning of your courage, and the beginning of your call steadfast until the end. You know, they are careless. Can you be careless to you? No, I can't. No, I can't. Why? Because there's a condition. I must hold the beginning of my confidence, conviction, consecration, steadfast until the end. Look at verse 15. In verse 15, it says, While it is said today, if ye will hear his voice, harden not your hearts, as in the provocation. Verse 16, it says, For some when they had heard, did provoke, albeit not all that came out of Egypt by Moses. Then in verse 17, it says, For with whom, but with whom was he grieved forty years? It was, was it not, with them that had sinned, grieved, grieved. 
Because they had sinned. Would you understand? The father becomes grieved. I am grieved and I repent of, I regret my creating them. Genesis chapter 6. And then grieve not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit too can be grieved. And Jesus looking at them was grieved because of their unbelief. The Father can be grieved. The Son can be grieved. The Holy Ghost can be grieved. And when people, they, they, just, they just live anyhow. I'm born again. They live anyhow. I'm saved. They live anyhow. And they do. Even worse than unbelievers who have never been born again, what they do? And they still say, I am born again. You grieve the Father. You grieve the Son. You grieve the Holy Ghost. And then it says, those carcasses fell. In the wilderness, look at verse 18, in verse 18, and to whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest, but to them that believed not. They believed first, that's how they came out of the land of captivity. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. And they applied the blood on the lintels of their houses. They believed. And then they came into the wilderness. The Red Sea was divided. And out they sang for joy and sang with faith. And water came out of the rock. And they believed. And the manna started coming from heaven. And they believed. But then later they said, this manna. They despised the manner. They belittled the manner. They disrespected the giver. And then they believed not. Verse 19. In verse 19. So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. We're looking at chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. I'm reading from verse 25. Hebrews chapter 12. We're looking at verse 25. See that she refused not him that speaketh. For if they escaped not who refused him that speak on earth much more shall not we escape much more shall we not escape you know there are people that act as sin the new testament gives you liberty to sin and they say the old testament will not allow you to do that you cannot just keep on sinning but now they say because of grace and because his father and because it's jesus the son of his love and because of the Holy Ghost a comforter the thing that gives us more liberty to keep on see, look at this see that she refused not him that speaketh present tense for if they escape not past tense who refuse past tense him that speak past tense on earth much more Shall we not escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven? Look at verse 26. In verse 26, whose voice then shook the earth. But now, but now, but now, in this dispensation, he has promised saying, yet once more, I shake not the earth only, but also heaven. Verse 27, and this word, yet once more, signified the removing of those things that are shaking, as of things that are made, that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Only the man that will not be shaken. The lies of the devil doesn't shake him. And the activities of devil worshippers don't shake him. And the lies and the deception of false preachers who will not keep to the word, they don't change him. 
Only the people and the things that cannot be shaken will remain. In verse 28, it says, Wherefore, we receive in a kingdom which cannot be moved. Let us have grace. After salvation, let us have grace. After sanctification, let us have grace. After victory and trial, let's still go back to God. Let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence. Serve God with reverence. Serve God with honor. Serve God with respect. Not that, you know, we just sin there, sin there, sin there, and then we come. Amen, hallelujah, I worship and adore you. Who are you talking to? Are you worshiping God for sin? And your conscience is not even pricked. It says, if we're going to serve him acceptably, we come with reverence and godly fear. Verse 29, for our God is, not was, even now, 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 the people who relegate his words is standard to the background and they just seen any, anyhow. They're coming from the room of adultery and fornication and they come to take the microphone and they say, Praise the Lord. Isn't God good? God is good all the time. God is looking at that person. If you continue like that, you'll perish in hell. He hates sin. And he hates the underman sinner that comes from the place of sin and then comes to the pulpit and is preaching for our God is a consuming fire. We're coming to point number three now. Point number three, we're looking at the sanctification for graciously open blood bought servants. The people that are following after the Lord, they are open. Uh, you show me a believer. If it's a real believer, it's open. There's nothing hidden. There's nothing that, you know, is swooping under the carpet. There's nothing. I hope God does not see this. I hope Jesus does not see this. I hope the Holy Ghost will not discover this. I hope my nearest friend, my nearest believer will not see this. No, you are not sanctified then. If there's something you're hiding, they even trying to hide from God. And he's saying, Adam, Adam, where are you? Eve, where are you? Son, where are you? Daughter, where are you? I heard your voice and I'm hiding somewhere. Have you done something? Have you taken of that forbidding fruit? When we are real children of God, we live in the presence of God with openness, we're blood bought, we're blood cleansed, and we're blood sanctified, and we're blood energized because of what his blood has done. We're open. Before God, open. Before people, you don't feel like, you know, the people that hear the siren of, uh, you know, the, the boss or the vehicle of a policeman and they're hiding somewhere, they're putting this, they're putting this there. Why? Are you not a believer? Do you have to wait for the siren of the policeman? Can't you take cue, instruction from the siren of your own conscience and don't have to do anything you'll be hiding? There are three things we're looking at here. Number one, we're looking at the fellowship of the sanctified saints with the sanctifier. Number two, the faithfulness of sanctified servants in a service, number three, the forthrightness of sanctified souls to the scripture. We're looking at number one. Number one, we're looking at the fellowship of sanctified saints with the sanctifier. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 11, for both he that sanctifieth, both he that sanctifieth, some people tell us to sanctify it to set apart to set apart for holy use 
And whatever you set apart for holy use must be holy itself. You cannot set Nadab and Abihu apart. They are not holy, and then you set them apart for God sanctifies. You cannot set Saul apart after he said, I feared the people. And because I feared the people, I disobeyed the Lord. You cannot say that unholy man apart for the Lord, for the service of the Lord. Neither can you set something sleeping on the lilac lap. You cannot set him apart for holy use. If you are set apart for holy use, your heart, your mind, your thoughts, your life must be saved and you must be transparently holy in the sight of the Lord. The fellowship of sanctified saints will be sanctified for both he that sanctifies and they who are sanctified are all of one for which cause is not ashamed before the angels, is not ashamed before the Father, is not ashamed before the world to call them brethren. When we're sanctified, when we're purged and purified on the inside, on the outside, and there is no guilt, no condemnation, nothing, no slight condemnation. And we know we're sanctified by the blood of the Lamb. Then we can come to God united with Christ the sanctifier. We're looking at John chapter 17, verse 17. John 17, 17, sanctify them through thy truth. You're not sanctified by error. You're not sanctified by deception. You're not sanctified by self-deception. I'm okay, I'm okay, I'm okay. And then you repeat it so many times. That one doesn't sanctify. Self-talk. I am a child of God. I am a child of God. Your conscience is screaming. And then you keep on repeating, I'm a child. That one doesn't sanctify anybody but the truth of the word of God. The truth that says here is the truth of Christ and the truth personified Christ. If the truth will set you free, you'll be free indeed. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Hebrews chapter 13, I'm reading from verse 12. Hebrews 13, verse 12, Therefore, wherefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, the blood that saves us, the blood that forgave us, the blood that cleansed us, it is in blood that sanctifies us, pure, holy, Harmless, spotless, sinless blood. It said Jesus also that he might sanctify the people with his own blood so far without the gate. In verse 13, it says, let us go forth therefore unto him without the camp, bearing his reproach. If you are if you are dodging persecution, there's no way you can be sanctified. If you are dodging reproach, if you are dodging the insult of the world, if you are dodging the perplexing activities of backsliders, there's no way you can be sanctified. But when you're ready to bear his reproach, and you go on and you say sanctification, holiness, purity of heart, and the ticket to get to heaven is more important for me than anything on earth. That's how we get sanctified. That's our consecration. Then in verse 14, it says, For we have, for here have we no continuing city, but we seek one to come. We'll get there in Jesus' name. You will get there in Jesus' name. We're looking at number two here. Number two is the faithfulness of sanctified servants in his service. What's faithfulness? Being full of faith in the absence of anybody watching us. Look at me here, a preacher. 
let's say my wife is not around, and then I made the vow to her and her only until death do us part, and we cannot be in the same physical place every time. What's faithfulness? My faithfulness is that when she's upset, when she's there's no way she can hear of what I'm doing now, and yet I still do the right thing, the righteous thing. Not because she's there, even when she's not there. That's faithfulness. When you have the word of God. And this is what the word of God says. And whether pastor is there, whether my pastor's wife is there or not, whether your leaders, overseers are there or not, whether there's anyone to challenge you or not, or maybe you have silenced everybody. You have shut the mouth of everyone that he dares not challenge me. Ah, you know, faithfulness is when nobody is courageous enough to challenge you and yet you keep faithfully to the word of God that is faithfulness. And show me who is a Christian, a faithful Christian today. Show me who is a faithful minister today. Show me who is faithful to their vow unto God, their consecration unto God, their vow to their husband, their vow to their wife. Would they not rather that their wife should be away so they can be free? Free to sin and free to go to hell. Would they not rather want their husbands to be away, at least to be in the other place, so they can be free, free to sin and free to go to hell? But you know, the faithful people are the people that hold on to the word of God. They have conviction, not because wife, husband, member, minister, overseer, anyone is there, they are committed to the word of God to every detail every cross of a T and every dot of an I and no matter what anybody does and how anybody reacts he is faithful to the word that the faithfulness the Lord is talking about he tells us in Hebrews chapter 3 and we're reading from verse 1 wherefore holy brethren those are the only kinds of brethren that heaven knows anything about Holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and the high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. Verse 2, in verse 2 it says, who was faithful to him that appointed him. Faithful to him that appointed him as also Moses was faithful in all his house. May he see us faithful all the time, everywhere, anytime, in Jesus' name. We're looking at First Corinthians chapter 4, and I'm reading here from verse 2. First Corinthians chapter 4, we're reading from verse 2. It tells us in verse 2, moreover, it is required in stewards, all stewards, man or woman, in the morning, in the afternoon, or evening, or night. It is required in stewards that a man and woman be found faithful. Look at number three here. Number three, we're looking at the forthrightness of sanctified souls to the scripture. The forthrightness of sanctified souls to the scriptures. It tells us in a uh, Second Timothy chapter 2, and I'm reading from verse 15. Second Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. Study to show thyself approved unto God. I'm saved, I'm saved. Go beyond that. Study to show thyself approved unto God. I'm an ordained minister. Go beyond that. Study, endeavor. To show yourself approved unto God. Everybody knows me. Everybody knows my service. They know how forthright I am. Go beyond that study. Endeavor. 
Do everything you can do to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed. When we come before the majesty of God on high, when every secret will be opened up, when every hidden sin will be known, then you're walking as a workman and God looks at your record and he looks at your face and he approves of you and you are not ashamed. That will be the greatest day in your existence in Jesus' name. And then he says, rightly dividing the word of truth. Rightly dividing the word of truth. Look up here. You know, if you are not rightly devoting your life to the truth, there's no way you rightly divide the word of truth. Now look, the preacher is a fornicator and he's living in sin or somebody there in the congregation and he comes to preach. He has not repented. He has not made persecution. He has not told that lady point blank what or doing is sinful. If we continued like that, if we died like that, we'll go to hell. It's not done that. And it comes to preach and it says the works of the flesh are manifest. Which are these? When it comes to fornication, adultery, it will try to swim around it. It will not be faithful to the word of God. Jesus said, if you look on a woman to lust at her, you've not even touched her. And you've not, uh, you know, pressed uh, the delicate part of your body against his body. You've not even done that. If you look on a woman to lost after her, you've committed adultery already in your heart. Now, when you come to that scripture, if you have been loose as a man, as a woman, so-called minister, you will not rightly divide the word of truth. You'll try to manipulate, you'll try to change, you'll try to dodge the real meaning of the word of God. But you know, he wants us to be forthright. He wants us to be faithful. He wants us to be sanctified through and through so that the excellent ministry that he had, you will have in Jesus' name. It says study, 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 endeavor to show yourself approved unto God. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed rightly dividing the word of truth. The Lord will cleanse us this morning. Amen. The Lord will turn our lives around for the better this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Look at verse 19. In verse 19, it tells us, nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal. The Lord knoweth them that are his. And let everyone, every minister, every preacher, every pastor, every evangelist, let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from inequity. That's what we are going to do now. I say that's what we're going to do now. And the cleansing power of the blood will take effect in your life in Jesus' name. And then uh, the empowering spirit of God will come in your life. And from today, your ministry will be taken to a higher level in Jesus' name. An excellent minister 
for an excellent ministry. The Lord confirm that in every one of us in Jesus' name. Let's rise up and pray and talk to the Lord now and say, Lord, here we are. Here I am. This is what I want to be. And the Lord will confirm it in every life. Let's rise up. Let's rise up. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer that the excellent ministry of Christ will be reproduced in the life of an excellent minister.